And welcome to The Skeptic Zone, episode number 64, for the 8th of January, 2010, or 2010, or how else can you say that? 10, or 2010. Let's just stick with 2010. On this week's show, we have a presentation given in 2005 at the Australian Skeptics National Convention by Loretta Marin, otherwise known as the Jellybean Lady. Now, her crusade is to rid the world of quack products like magnetic underlays and so forth, using jelly beans as an example. Jelly bean power, coming up in a few minutes. After that, a little report by Dr. Rachie and myself as we take a stroll down King Street in Newtown, a suburb here in Sydney, and visit a few pharmacies along the way. That's followed by Dr. Rachie Reports, where she talks to Dr. Sheena McGowan about parasites and malaria. Very interesting. So sit back, have a nice glass of yak's milk, and enjoy this episode of The Skeptic Zone. Breast cancer survivor Loretta Marin is a long-time crusader against quackery of all forms. She is best known as the Jelly Bean Lady. And here, in a talk given in 2005 at the Australian Skeptics National Convention, she discusses how jelly beans can often be better than magnetic therapy. Right, first of all, I'll show you what all this stuff is. I, I tend to come to presentations with a truckload of things. So one thing here is I'm very disappointed about this morning where we're not allowed to do that multi-level marketing. <laughs> because here I have something that we can all make a lot of money on. That's my uh, acupressure jelly bean bracelets, my jelly bean pain relief jewellery, and my jelly bean detox pads, the ones that you stick on your feet and overnight sucks out all the toxins. <clears throat> There's also the jelly bean herbal tea, and it, it genuinely is a herb because it comes from sugar. Herbs come from plants. And this is my other one, which I think is really good. This is my multi-homeopathic remedy. It may cure every disease and health condition. And in there, it's got vital force and memory of the remedy. And you all watch Second Opinion, so you do understand homeopathic remedies in that. It's about the memory of what you've put in there. Now, we do have some good medication here that really doesn't have too many side effects. I've got the pills there. <coughs> And this is the placebo pills, the famous placebo pills, proven to be 30% effective in curing everything, proven by thousands of clinical trials all over the world. So that's one thing that I do is I haven't found any side effects on it yet. In fact, it's actually good for diabetics and people giving up smoking because they go hypoglycemic. And I believe there's some new paste that you put on your ulcers that's got some glucose base, but... That's medical and that's not my area. But anything to do with it, um, jelly beans I'm interested in. And a guy said that when he makes beer, he puts a, jack, a black jelly bean and it stops all the, the goo going in it. So jelly beans are very, very handy sorts of things to have. Now, I've got some booklets here. Did you all get one? Oh, good, because there's plenty left if anybody wants some more. And you would have probably noticed in the centrefold, Geraldine's a centrefold girl. <laughs> as much information as I could put in about this particular adverse event. I've got the iridology chart there, so um, if anybody has any problems later on, I can certainly help. Oh, wrong one. When this came out, they hadn't invented electricity, so I think we must have done it by this. <laughs> And compliments of Geraldine. Now, there's only one person in the world I can email and say, hello, Geraldine, do you have an eyeball? And she said, yes, I've got an eyeball, a kidney and a heart. And she gave them to me for my presentations as well. Over here is my homie. Who's opened the... Um, there's a snake 
and the spider missing. Now, calm down. They're natural, so they're safe. <laughs> Has anybody... Uh, just quietly look around. Has anybody got... Oh, Rex. Rex is over there. Come on, Rex. Rex, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Throw, just, just throw him. He's a good... Come on. He's a good catch. <laughs> Woo! Ah. Uh, I'm fine there. Now, the cobra and rattlesnake is somewhere around here. The kiwis are rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just think. Come on, sweetheart. Now, these are genuine homeopathic bases. <laughs> got it. The anthrax. We've got the anthrax? Oh, thank God. People keep stealing that. I've got no idea why. <laughs> it's all natural. It's perfectly safe. And the citric acid and the mercury and the caffeine. The caffeine. <laughs> and, uh, and there's the million dollars. Still there. James Randi's million dollars for any one homeopathic remedy that can be proven. I've offered that money to a lot of people and they've never taken me up on it. Now, before I came, I had trouble sleeping. So I took my homeopathic remedy for sleeping, which is one drop of caffeine in a swimming pool. And for those of you <laughs> that don't know homeopathy, it's one drop in... Now, I did this last time, and I had to go around the board twice. <laughs> now, honestly, you know, those kids with critical thinking, do you really think that one drop in that many will have any effect? I said, oh, homeopathy, don't knock it unless you try it. And I thought, that can't, can't possibly be real. Huh? So what I've written on here? 300,000 homeopaths and 40 homeopathic universities, universities can't be wrong. So therefore, homeopathy must work. <laughs> <clears throat> so I do that for presentations for seniors. I have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Um, I've also had a lot of very negative feedback from the people that like their natural therapies. And um, they've been actually quite abusive. They've even made some fairly personal statements about me as well, which I thought was quite good because I will use it all for um, writing articles. And now the first one I'd like to talk about is how I became the power of one. In situations whereby somebody famous gets an illness, we saw Christopher Reeves and his broken back, Michael J. Fox, what they do is they suddenly champion the cause of that illness. And it's fantastic that they do that because they use their life skills and their position to raise awareness and raise money for research. How good is that? My favourite is Lance Armstrong. Now, he rides a bicycle for you ladies that don't follow the Tour de France. Not an exercise bicycle, a proper one. In 1996, this guy was rated number one in the world as a cyclist, you know, with a little cute... Bandex outfit and <laughs> big thick thighs. <laughs> anyway, they're awfully skinny though, these guys. Anyway, he was diagnosed with cancer. 1996, he was given a 20% chance of surviving. He had really radical chemotherapy, all that kind of stuff, and he decided he wasn't going to die. He was going to do everything he could. And for those of you that watched the Tour de France, he won it for the just a couple of weeks ago I thought wow that guy is inspirational and he's doing so much to raise awareness for these things too sometimes it takes some really negative event before we'll go out on a limb and follow a passion that we have to try to make some changes the fact that you all came to this conference suggests to me that perhaps it isn't a perfect world yet and you've all got some agenda that you want, would like to see changed I said they were creationists when they work. I had to get the 3,000 bloody dinosaurs on the ark. I'm with them. <laughs> Third, every day in Australia, 30 women are diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. Five die. Unfortunately, 1st of October 2003, I was one of those women. And I'm sitting there with these perfectly straight-faced doctors telling me about these horrific things that could happen to me. You know, cutting and cutting and burning and drugs. And I just couldn't believe it. Who's he talking to? I'm fine. I feel fantastic. 
Now, the only reason I'm going to live to be 100 is because of orthodox medicine. Because they got me early, a bit of a snip, a bit of a burn, and a lot of help to make sure that I'm going to be one of the survivors. When I had, for those of you that have been touched with um, cancer, most of you would have. Might be a neighbour, friend, family member, even yourselves. There were some gentlemen here before. You know that the treatment is very long. For me, it was four months from my diagnosis to the last treatment. The last eight weeks was driving a two-hour return trip into Brisbane for like a 20-second radiotherapy treatment. And during those times, sometimes the machine would be down and I'd be an hour or two in the waiting room. I talked to the other patients. Sometimes I had to talk to them through a voice box. These were wonderful people. You know, mothers with little children there. They were all going through the same horrific event that I was. And I know that a lot of them won't be here now. They'll be dead or they'll be dead soon. Some of them were really at the end, you know, being wheeled in and out. If I can achieve anything through getting my cancer through, the fun that I'm having with people like yourself, I will dedicate it to those people because they sure didn't deserve what they're getting. Wonderful people. National Seniors Association. Is anybody a member of National Seniors Association? You like all the cheap stuff? Right. No one else is, you man. <laughs> After the eight weeks... <laughs> you're not too, young, not too young to get a bargain. After the eight weeks of going in and out, one day it was suddenly over, and I woke up the next day and I was really a bit of a zombie. So you're just there, your whole life suddenly was planning, oh, we've got to get there by 11 o'clock. Every day is a different time. We've got to get there by 11 o'clock today. And that's it. That was your whole day taken over and recovering. And at the end of it, you're burnt. You, you totally met all these amazing people. You, I was sometimes really angry. I was sometimes really anxious, sad, shocked, all these things. It was a roller coaster trip for me. And really, your memory's gone. You can't remember names. You talk about that bloke with the colourful shirt in the front row that he got from... Salvation Army, da da da. You end up great long sentences, and they say, "Oh, Fred, yeah, or, or Peter, or this or that," and you can't believe where's my memory gone. That most of that's come back. But and I talked to my GP, who is over there, who name is here, being fantastic to work with her on the website. And I said, "What's wrong with me?" She said, "You've got traumatic stress." And I thought, "Well, she's right. That's a trauma." You know, so I, I understand now that what I was going through was quite a normal thing to happen. National Seniors Association, 300,000 members around Australia. The most vulnerable people on the planet. They're over 50s. What do they do? A few, about 10 years ago, I went back to uni and I did basic psychology, advertising English, just because I thought I would like to learn about those things. So really all that means is I know where I've got the books. But I know I'm good at looking things up. I could read ads. So I opened the book, page after page, herbal remedy for sex, for, you know, for knees, for joints, all famous people, page and page. And then page after page of miracle cure for cancer by this naturopath, for this cancer, for that. And then products that clearly defied physics and physiology. And I thought, this, this isn't right. So... I emailed the Food and Drugs Administration about one product and I started researching stuff. Compiled a great little letter, you know, saying that these things, this is the proof, this is the information. Sent it in to them. And of course, what did they do? Yeah, yeah, nothing. And at that time, I went to my oncologist, I had a meeting with her, and she, uh, she said, um, what are you doing, Loretta? And I said, you know, I said, I'm trying to fight, you know, like a probably $20 billion industry on my own. And I said, it's get me down a bit. I said, I'm just feeling a bit fragile. Um, I think I'm going to give up. She said, don't give up, Loretta. You'd be surprised how much power one person has. So I went home, turned on the computer, and I'll read you just a little bit of this because I was really angry. And I thought, right, I'll just start it off very sensitively, as I am. We, I demand you apologise to all your members. And this, this is a couple of things. Not only do you print ads for quacks, naturopaths, quackery, pills for sex and weight loss, and the possibility of some pesticide thrown in for good measure and banned products, but your policies even prevent quality information being made available to your computer literate uh, readers. 
And I had asked the computer section to put in Alzheimer's and tinnitus links for some new revolution. And he said, sorry, this is for fun. I'm not allowed to put health stuff in. And this guy was a retired pharmacist. And I ended it. I think you should apologise to your membership for the lost opportunities to give them advice and hope for their quality of life now and in the future and for the total lack of understanding in peddling snake oil products and services. And I went and found every email in that bloody newspaper and faxed it off to them. I thought, that's, I've done all I can. Anyway, they got back to me. They said, Loretta, could you put an unemotional argument to the editor? <laughs> so I, thought, I better keep away. In fact, I kept away pretty well up until last week, away from the email, wrote a nice letter, said, just give me a couple of weeks to put my argument together. And my argument was that a lot of people over 50, the only non-financial magazine they get is the National Seniors Association one. That's all they get. And they can't afford the $6 for Women's Weekly. Uh, the other one is that, unfortunately, over, for people over 50, 50% 50 of them have clinical evidence of Alzheimer's. That's not too bad. We've all got a bit of a memory problem there. And all these things I linked to websites. And also only 2% of people are going to have enough money to retire on. And I went on with all the facts and figures. And I'm pleased to say that the dodgy health products are gone, the naturopaths are gone. Some of the pills are still there, but there were only two pages of it. So one person can make a difference. And one thing, there's another one too. <laughs> I to get a bit gung-ho about this because, you know, Geraldine, I've got someone to boast to that gives a damn. <laughs> the local new paper had the detox pad, you know, not, not the proper ones, but those artificial ones that, you know, they put out in front of the naturopaths places. And so I attached a C letter that said um, the C is seeking um, to, keeping an eye on the media that's exploiting the vulnerable. And that's why I always put senior on everything. Because seniors are seen to be vulnerable, whereas adults aren't for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people senior is, you know, if it's not for you, it's your grandmother, but everything I've written is for anybody else. Anyway, I complained. And he wrote back, thank you for bringing the advertisement to our attention. We will certainly not be accepting any further advertising from this particular person. I thought, you champion. <laughs> One person can make a difference. Now, the thing about teams, right, just don't like to mention the team business, but the sceptics have a reputation. They're the world's worst team people. There's 3,000 of you all doing 3,000 different things, and no one wants to help the guy on the left or the right. And it's, the sceptics will readily admit that. But I want to put this on record, that from the first day on my journey, when I'm wobbling along on my bike with the training wheels, Barry was there, hanging on the back, <laughs> giving me advice and guidance. He and the team were there, pushing me along. And then when finally I was going, oh, it's not bad, they were cheering and clapping and telling me to go. I could not have, I would not have had the self-confidence to do what I have done today if it wasn't for Barry, Dr. Richard Gordon, Richard Saunders, Geraldine Moses, um, Bob Bruce, Lillian Derrick, Laurie Eddy, and a few, quite a few others I don't even know who took the time to email me or to complain about something else. Now, one thing about complaining I will mention, women love complaining. Go on, girls, complain more! <laughs> right, and that's how I got the name, The Power of One. If me and a tiny team can achieve so much, just imagine how much we could do if a few more of you got on. And just did anything, even positive thoughts will help. And that's why I put this out. <laughs> now, two reasons I put this out. One, this was a photo taken. Now, what have I achieved? Okay. Apart from that, I will shortly be featured in New Idea. I'm not sure when. Um, and they took, a, they took all these photos on me. This is the best one. I thought, this is the last photo I ever want taken. Because I look quite good in it. <laughs> and I thought, what can I do? Can I approach New Idea um, about putting in something in GP places? in surgeries, to let patients do their own research. The one thing I am good at is being a patient. <clears throat> Other thing too, Australian doctor. Now, how many GPs get Australian do GPC? Australian doctor. June 17, check your copy. The very, very first ever patient story is moi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
And that comes from nagging the crap and emailing people. It wasn't necessarily about the skills that I have. Now, we'll just have a quick story about the magnetic story. Um, Geraldine, as I say, I keep, she fits in my life in 10 different places. I first got to know her when I did the booklet. And I thought I was so smart, I thought, I'll write a booklet. I showed you, I think I was on the drugs then or something. And I thought, I've got to adverse events. I thought, that's a person. You can talk to a person about drugs. I thought, how good is that? A person. And I'm so good at contact us. I thought, there's a line. It's in Brisbane. You can actually ring somebody up. I thought, fantastic. Anyway, so I thought, I'll ask permission. And you can see it's in white. It's so important to me. Talk to a person. So I did. So I got on to someone. They said, I said, can I use the adverse event stuff? You'll have to talk to Geraldine Moses. <laughs> that woman on the radio. So I ring up Geraldine. And I say, you know, trying to sound like I'm spruiked a bit. She says, what's the objective of your book? But, oh, to help seniors get in, make informed choices on orthodox and complementary and alternate medicine. I thought, sounds pretty smart. She said, what do you know about CAM? I said, nothing. I said, I direct them all to the Skeptics Dictionary. $64 million answer. After that, Geraldine couldn't do enough to help. And the woman is writing a feminine thesis. She's got a one-year-old kid. She takes the booklet. I'm very black and white. She softened it fixed it. She hasn't got rid of me since. We're still doing duo, eh? <laughs> and that was her, and I thank you for doing that. And even, all right, the magnetic therapy. I told Geraldine she'd know me at a party. I'm wandering around after people's magnets. And this is the wonderful device itself here. My beloved gas meter. People have admitted, even my friends, right, the best thing with my friends when I decided I was going to prove magnetic therapy was bullshit. They said to me, after several attempts to show them, as I mentioned in my articles, they said, all right, Loretta, we believe you, and I leave your bloody magnets at home. And I thought, no, I never did, but that was enough from my friends to prove that it, I could show them that they were being defrauded, the, the jelly bean underlays. I prepared these for Ger to show Geraldine, but they weren't like this. They were two raggy bits of material stapled together. And I had them ready to show her on the day, we'll mention this, won't we, the first recorded ESP ever in history. <laughs> Geraldine, 12 months before, had given me a phone number. And I, I had worked in public service. I filed it. One day, my phone was out a week, and I told Geraldine I was going to drop in that day. So I think the conversation went something like that. And I had these to show her. And I said, ring, ring. Hello, Geraldine, it's Loretta. What? Are you ringing me? I said, yes, I'm ringing you. You can't be ringing me because I'm ringing you. I said, no, I'm ringing you. We went like that fat fight. And I said, Geraldine. She said, why are you ringing me? I said, well, it was. You're not mad at us, Ricardo. She says, I said, to tell you I can't make it to where you are. She said, I'm not even at work. I'm at the university. And I said, well, well, why are you ringing me, Geraldine? She said, Brisbane Extra want you on. And she said, would you do it? I said, I would walk on broken glass to do that presentation. And she said, well, that sounds like King Loretta. <laughs> anyway, so I managed in those next few days to delay them so I could look like I knew what I was doing. I'm Irish, right? I had the jar. I had the jelly bean underlay. An Australian jelly bean underlay. <laughs> and there's the real one. There's the jelly bean one. I hide them and I do demos. And for some reason, everybody has always picked the jelly bean <laughs> underlay. Even my surgeon saying, that one. I saw the needle flicker. It's that one. And I don't know. I, oh, sorry. And, the, and they're actually better because if they don't work, you can eat them. So. <laughs> and they have no side effects. So that... As I say, it was an emergency rush to my girlfriend's house so she could sew up these <laughs> for the presentation. Later on, not too much later on, I'll be showing the video and we can go through that. Would you, we got time for that now? Yes? Now, Dr. Lisa Larkso is over here. She features, she's the good looking one in the video. And this is the nose we'll be looking up in a minute. So, <laughs> so you ready? Yes? Uh, no volume. Okay. Three forms of pain relief is magnetic therapy. 
Lisa Huntingwell has been looking at the products that are available and whether they do work. Magnetic therapy, there are the underlays. Basically, you're receiving the benefits every single night. The spot treatments. The isolate the particular painful area, whether it's a knee, wrist, elbow, ankle. The faithful. <coughs> you just feel so much better. The pain goes. And the knockers. People are not being told the truth. For years, there's been a hard sell on magnets to treat pain. Craig Trinder says he brought the therapy to Australia. A former motorbike racer, he says he broke 30 bones and his back and spent years on drugs before trying magnets in the US. In uh, three days, I noticed the difference in the pain relief and then after about uh, 15 days, totally gone. It was just incredible. Craig says he's sold 300,000 products since starting Gold Coast-based company Biomagnetic and he happily presents customers who say the therapy works. There's a carpal tunnel and... Uh, that kept me awake at night, prevented me from using my hands, and uh, within two weeks, I was sleeping right through the night. Within six weeks, I was able to get up, up, up out of bed and move around like I was a 16-year-old again. But skeptics <laughs> don't buy a word of it. <laughs> Anecdotal statements are not evidence. Loretta Marin calls herself the jelly bean lady. She's on a campaign to prove many alternative therapies simply don't work. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Many mothers with small children who have bumps and bruises, you give them a jelly bean, they are instantly cured. And that's just a placebo effect. And the placebo effect is what Loretta believes is at play when people find magnetic therapy working. She says many consumers get no benefit, but you don't hear of them. A number of the people that I know that have bought some of these magnetic products, they have put them in their cupboards, they have put them on their verandas. Why is Loretta so passionate? Well, she had breast cancer, prompting her to investigate treatments for chronic illnesses. She has a maths and physics degree, so she looks for evidence which she says is severely lacking when it comes to magnets. The people I represent are cancer patients and seniors, and they really don't have the money to be buying placebo product. So where does all this leave the people in the middle? Consumers, salespeople on one side, skeptics on the other, can be tough making an informed decision. Well, science is trying to give us conclusive answers. Well, there's obviously a lot of investment in of money in it, and people do seem to suggest that it helps them, so we need to find out whether it in fact does and, and how it does it. In a Griffith University study, strong flux magnets are being placed directly on the skin of people with tennis elbow pain. The indications are that perhaps there is an effect, perhaps that effect is not a nerve-based response, perhaps there's something else that's happening, and that's what we have to go on to, to, to test. So far, only a handful of patients have been studied, and researchers admit measuring pain levels scientifically is proving tough. Well, it's pretty frustrating because I don't, I'm not sure at this point in time that we have the technology to actually measure what effects are, are actually occurring. As they persevere, the Australian Consumers Association says it's found no conclusive scientific evidence to support magnets, but nothing either to say they're harmful, except maybe to the hip pocket. These underlays sell for $299 for a queen bed. Craig started out offering money-back guarantees, but doesn't now. Case studies on it, I think I'll be on it. The Consumers Association advises people trying magnetic therapy to look for products with money-back guarantees. And the jelly bean lady, well, she has her own suggestion. I think if you want to try magnet magnetic therapy at home, just grab a fridge magnet and put it on the spot. The power of... Examining the truth and exposing the frauds, badpsychics.co.uk is the website that critically examines mediums, clairvoyance and psychics. Follow the controversies, news and discussions in the lively forum community. And now you can download your weekly fix of Righteous Indignation, the official podcast of badpsychics.co.uk that talks hard and critically about the paranormal. Badpsychics.co.uk, the UK's largest and most respected sceptical site looking at psychics. It's uh, Richard Saunders here with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. We're walking down King Street in Newtown, Newtown, the suburb in Sydney. And Rachel, do we actually ever relax from this? No. <laughs> no we, 
because we although, had. A, although, can I just say, we just saw a wheelie bin roll down the street, though, which was quite amusing. It was in the middle of the road, and it's it was, a main road. It was stuck behind a truck, and the truck drove off, and the bin followed it. Yeah, it was, it was very funny. sweet. It went through the intersection and everything. <laughs> So we, we just had a, a nice lunch and a chat, and then we decided to check out some pharmacies. We did, we did. And we had a bit of a win and a massive fail. Yes, we did. Well, we had a win, Richard, because we went into a, a big pharmacy, and it's stocked from floor to ceiling with supplements and whey powders and all kinds of stuff that for which there's not much evidence, but at least there's stuff in it, you know, unlike homeopathy. And we asked if they had homeopathy... And she looked at us quizzically and said, no, we don't have it. And we looked at each other and thought, what? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, which product do you want? And we, we were a bit shocked. We just said, we don't. <laughs> I didn't really know what to say because I've never had someone in a pharmacy tell me they don't have homeopathy. So we was, thought, oh, that's all right. And we said, well, that's good. We're glad you don't. Mm. We went around out, out the street, walked a couple of hundred metres... As the cars go by, we'll just duck into the street here. It might be a bit better. Um, oh, this is the street where you work. That's better. And so we um, walked down to another pharmacy. Hmm. Um, because you wanted to check out what it said on the packet, packets of homeopathy. Yeah, because we had an email from a listener who said that it, it says on the side of the boxes, active ingredient, and then it list as, lists the ingredients but with their dilutions. So essentially, that should say active ingredients, none. Yeah. So we just wanted to confirm this. So. That's right. We walked in and we were just studying the boxes and the friendly assistant from the front desk came up and said, can I help you, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry. And then you said, we noticed there was homeopathy there for children, pain and fever mm. and this sort of thing. And so we inquired... Oh, you said to her, does this work? Mm. Do you think it works? She said, oh, yes, it works because our customers keep coming back and telling us it works. Mm. So we thought, oh, that's a bit of a fail. Um, then I tried to explain to her that that's just anecdote. And she and you said, do you know what homeopathy is? And her answer was, oh, yes, it's all natural and herbs. Yeah. And then she pointed to the side of the box where it said active ingredients. And she said, look, it says, and it said Arnica 30C. This was Arnica, not um, baby stuff. And I said, yeah, that means it's diluted 10 to the negative 30 times. And she said, oh, it's still there, it's still there, it works. They tell me it works, they tell me. Yeah, yeah. She hadn't got a clue what we were talking about, no, really. No, no. And then I said, but you know that people report that um, the placebo works too. <laughs> and her, her response was just priceless. This is a woman working in a pharmacy, yeah. selling medicine. She said... Oh, I don't know what a placebo is. That's above my head. Yeah. Fail. Yeah. She Terrible. didn't even know what the placebo effect is. Yeah. And when I suggested that it might be dangerous to give my child something that has nothing in it, instead of perhaps paracetamol or codeine, she said, oh, no, no, they say it works, they say it works. Yeah. So... So, pharmacies of New South Wales, what are you doing? You got so, and, and I just wanted to point out that when I worked in a restaurant as a waitress... I had to know everything that was in the food that I was serving to people. I had to know whether there was nuts in it, whether there was gluten in it, where there was wheat in it, even just where the particular ingredients came from so that I could give people an informed choice when they chose a dish to put in their mouths. Yeah, yeah. And she And this woman is selling matter. this water to people with children with with fever. Fever. Yeah. And saying I don't know what a placebo is. I don't know what's in it. It works. So, inexcusable. So another tact we seriously have to consider now is simple consumer affairs. These products claim, state quite clearly on the package, contains, mm. and they don't. They don't. Uh, they don't. I can't sell something which doesn't contain something. Why, why can these homeopathists get away with it? No. I couldn't work in a restaurant and say, I'll sell you a dozen oysters and then just take out the shells. Thank you, Dr. Ricci. Another interesting adventure. You're listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. When I'm not tuned into the Skeptic Zone, I'm recording the Skeptoid podcast, doing what I can to further knowledge by blasting away the widespread pseudosciences that infect popular culture. I've also compiled a 40-minute educational video on critical thinking called Here Be Dragons at herebedragonsmovie.com. 
I hope you check those out, and I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Hello everyone and welcome to Dr. Rachie Reports. Regular listeners would recall that I recently attended a conference on the Gold Coast called the International Proteolysis Society. Here I spoke to several scientists, one of whom I present this week. Dr. Sheena McGowan is a structural biologist from Monash University in Melbourne. Sheena's primary area of research is malaria and in particular designing new drugs to combat the parasite. Malaria is a health crisis in the developing world with statistics showing that one child dies every 20 seconds from malaria and 500 million new cases occur every year. Sheena also tells us about a new vaccine for malaria which is scheduled to be rolled out across Africa in 2010. Something else for the anti-vaxxers to complain about. As you'll hear in this interview, Sheena and her team are using a unique and elegant way of targeting the parasite with new drugs. And I'm here today with Sheena McGowan. Hi Sheena, how are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone. We're in a um, rather tropical setting today, aren't we, for the International Proteolysis Conference? Gorgeous setting. Yep. Yeah, and apparently the pool here is quite famous, but I haven't been down there yet. You're going for a swim after this, After this, yeah, that's where I intend to go to, yep. <laughs> Apparently they have a living reef within their pool, so... Yeah, and you can swim and look at the fish, yep. and yeah. Yep. Well, let's talk science for a moment. Before that, um, you're a structural biologist. Can you just explain to our listeners a little bit in brief, what is a structural biologist? A structural biologist looks at proteins, the protein structure. So proteins are enzymes and basically all the working functions of the body. Um, and so what we do is actually determine the three-dimensional structure and shape of proteins. Um, and from that, what we do is infer how they work, what function they do. Um, and for me personally, I go on then to design drugs that may stop them from functioning. Now, you gave a very interesting talk just earlier today about malaria. Um, you're looking in particular at designing drugs yep, to treat drugs. malaria. Yep. Can you just give our listeners a little bit of background about the problem that is malaria? Malaria remains a global health issue. Um, In Australia, we're very lucky at the moment. We don't have malaria, um, but malaria actually does remain a global health crisis. Um, So the statistics actually run that there's um, one child dies every 20 seconds from malaria somewhere in the world, that there's 500 million cases every year, and from that, 2 million people will die from malaria. What I find more frightening is that half the world's population live at risk of contracting the disease. And so they're they're just huge statistics. And then they're the mortality statistics that exist, and mostly they're in developing nations. Um, But you've got to factor in as well that in developing nations, malaria, if someone has malaria and they also unluckily have HIV or TB, they get even sicker. So they have a synergistic effect between the two diseases. Um, And so you have these huge health issues for countries that really can't afford to deal with them. Um, And then also these countries have economic... um, There's an economic um, cost to malaria because their population is sick and they're not going to work. And so the statistics at the moment say that any country that has a high disease rate of malaria will actually lose 1.3% of their economic growth simply because of malaria. Um, And for a developing country, 1.3%... That's a huge amount for economic growth. So mm. controlling malaria, although we think it might be something that you know used to exist and we have drugs for it, and if you go to Thailand, you take drugs for it, it's still a major, major problem within the country, within the world. So, so you mentioned the drugs. What is the current therapies? Um, and you also alluded to the rollout of a malaria vaccine there is, next year. Yeah, Can you tell really us about exciting. that? Really um, exciting. I can't give you the ex- exact date. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it is. There is a brand new malaria vaccine. Um, it's going to be rolled out in Africa. Uh, at this stage, they believe it will be 30%. I believe the numbers are 30% effective. The problem with malaria is with drugs or vaccines, and they do believe this vaccine will be effective, is that the parasites are really clever. They work out a way to get around all our drugs, and so they think the vaccine might last for 18 months. So although it sounds wonderful that there's a vaccine, mm. for most of us who do the research, we realise we're still going to have to keep coming with new drugs. Malaria treatment um, is a combination therapy, generally depending on where you've got the malaria located in the world as to how you get treated. Um, we had one drug that used to be the you know, the end drug that if you couldn't treat it with anything else, you used to go in with that one. Uh, I think three months ago they reported the first resistance to that drug. Um, so the problem with malaria is that it can be treated and it can be cured usually. Um, 
you just need constant new drugs because a parasite just keeps evolving resistance to everything that we throw at it. And because so many people in the world have it, there's a lot of drugs floating around all through the system all the time. Um, so we just need basically like weaponry. We need different treatment options to combat it. Mm. And unfortunately for developing nations, they need to be very cheap and they need to be very effective. There's no point building a drug that's going to be really, really costly because the countries can't afford to buy it. Yeah. Um, it's fine for tourists. You know, it's fine for us if we want to go to Thailand. We can afford to buy it. But in Africa or Southeast Asia where these problems are endemic, it needs to be really, really cheap and really effective. You mentioned that the, the um, parasite is very clever and so for that reason you're focusing on a very specific part of its life cycle. We are. Uh, you're looking at um, its um, sort of food supply yep. and you're targeting an enzyme that allows it to break down blood. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So the idea on new drugs, and this is what everyone around the world is focusing on the same thing, we don't want it, just another generation of the same thing that you know, might have a different chemical added to it that the malaria, the parasites will develop resistance to quite fast. What we're looking at now is a whole new target. Um, and the idea be basically being is if we can stop the parasite from eating, and that's what it uses is haemoglobin to basically mm. eat, and that's its food source, um, we'll starve to death. It's, it's a very simple concept. So these two enzymes that we focus on are the very final stages of its food cycle as such. It breaks down haemoglobin, which is found in red blood cells, um, through a very complicated process. But at the very end, it becomes a very simple process, and there's one step that they have to complete to get what they need at the end of it. Um, and our two enzymes that we're targeting are that very final step. And our theory is that if we can just stop the final step, then they're, they're, they're a bit stuck. They won't be able to get their free amino acids, they can't build their own proteins, and the parasite dies. And we have some very effective um, data from mouse malaria and from like in, culture, in vitro culture to say that this will work very, very well. So, so what you're doing is you're designing a compound that kind of fits like a... a key into a lock yes. into a part of that enzyme, Absolutely. aren't you? Absolutely. So the enzymes are proteases, so they break down proteins generally. So um, what we're doing is essentially putting a compound into the middle of that protease where it would normally... Um, in a normal situation, it would you know chew something up, it would break it down. We're actually going to stop that protease from working completely. Um, and so what we're doing is inhibiting the function of that protease, and then it's essentially dead in the water. It can't do what it's meant to do, um, and it stops the process of hemoglobin digestion. Mm. This method, Sheena, is different to how uh, it, some drug development processes work by screening large quantities of, say, naturally occurring compounds, but the method you're using is really very specific, isn't it, by working out the shape of this enzyme first and then designing something to fit into it. Yeah, we've been very, very lucky. I mean, from a drug design point of view, everyone would like to be able to do what we've done, and sometimes it's not possible. So what we did was go and actually look at the details, the atomic details of the two enzymes, and we can really now tell. There's, there's, you know, When we look at commercial compounds that are out there, we could say now that won't work because of this. Um, mm. because we have exquisite detail of these active sites. Um, so now we can actually go through with the help of medicinal chemists, um, so you know, pharmaceutical medicinal chemists who understand that you know, chemicals have got to make it through to the human body and they've got to be soluble in water and they can't be toxic. And you know, we can say to them, oh, well, can we have this compound here? And they can go yes or no. And they can say, well, can we add that there? And I will be able to say to them, well, no, you can't because that won't fit with the protease. Mm. So... Um, it does give us incredible detail to go and design drugs that, that will hopefully work. So, yeah. Well, you developed that method by analysing the protein by its structure. Yes. So you actually crystallised it, didn't we you? We did, yes. Yep. And then how do you go from making a crystal of a protein into working out how it is structured? What we do is, so we literally, uh, you make the protein in a soluble form and you, cr you grow crystals, um, and that is a process in itself. So if you're lucky enough to get crystals of a protein, uh, which we were for this particular project, um, what we do is we take the crystals to the Australian Synchrotron, um, and that's a large X-ray beam facility, um, and basically we throw X-ray beams at it, oh, right. and the idea being that the crystal is solid and the X-ray beams hit it, and they diffract in a certain pattern. And the way they diffract, the way they bounce off the crystal, will be dependent on what the protein looks like in three-dimensional space. So we can't see the protein, of course, it's beyond what we can see. But what we do is take the diffraction data from those X-ray beams and through mathematical calculations and a lot of um, computational power, we convert that to what that means in terms of three-dimensional space. And that becomes our X-ray crystal structure. So, so is that a similar process to, say, how the structure of DNA was finally absolutely, elucidated? Absolutely, yeah. completely the same. So our listeners yep. would know about that and yep, how the definitely. double helix was eventually yep. elucidated. And interestingly, the first protein, I think, to be crystallised was haemoglobin. 
Oh, um, right. So omyoglobin was one of the first ones ever to be done for a protein structure. Right. Um, and that's where the, the, the study of structural biology came from, was the diffraction data from protein crystals and that um, translation and calculation from diffraction data to what it looks like in three-dimensional space. Yeah. yeah. So this is a really good example, Sheena, of how basic science that you and I do in the lab every day, you know, which is um, sometimes people don't really understand how this applies to a bigger problem um, in in the developing world and also in a clinical sense. But in addition, I just wanted you to give our listeners an idea of how many people are involved in this project. Because I know oh, you have this project lots and lots huge. of collaborators oh, and lots of funding no, bodies. No, and, and to be fair, projects like mine simply can't exist. One laboratory these days cannot do the science that we need to do. I mean, our understanding has progressed so far that you need to bring in people with every level of expertise. So I'm a structural biologist, so I do X-ray crystallography, um, and we do structural biology, so we do this kind of computational design and things like that. Monash University has a huge structural biology um, unit and that's our focus for this project however of course it's a malarial project I'm not a malarial parasitologist so we have a large group in Queensland at the Queensland Institute of Medical Research and that's headed up by um, Dr Don Gardner and they've done huge amounts of research into this they've done mouse murine studies on malaria so of course, we can't, you know, test humans for our drugs, so we, we do have to test mice. Yeah. Um, they've also done, in culture, um, all of the human parasite cell lines and testing. So all the parasitology has been done here in Queensland. The actual enzyme itself was identified by Professor John Dalton, um, who at the time was at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, and he and his students and postdocs actually identified the proteases. They worked out how they worked. They worked out how to purify them and make them soluble. Um, Professor Dalton now is at McGill University in Canada, so we continue to have a great collaboration with him over there. Um, the Australian Synchrotron has been a huge resource for this. You, you can't do drug design without a Synchrotron mm-hmm. in your nation. So we used to have to go to Chicago before Australia Synchrotron was built. Now I'm very lucky that I'm 10 minutes down the road from there and we have allocated time. It wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, and then the drugs themselves. So the chemistry of what we build, it's very easy for me to look on a com- computer and say, I need that and that and that. You need to find someone to make it. Um, and so we have groups from America and Poland who made all of those compounds. And, of course, we have all our funding bodies who pay the bills. Mm, of course, <laughs> so yeah. it's a huge collaboration. A huge These collaboration, projects yeah. are huge. And yeah. they'll only get bigger as they go along too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for talking to us today, Sheena, and good luck with the rest of your work on malaria. <laughs> thanks very much for that. Well, there's just another example of how basic bench science is helping solve a big clinical problem in the developing world. We thank Dr. Sheena McGowan for her time, and if you'd like to know more about her work and that of her team, head to www.monash.edu.au and search for Dr. Sheena McGowan, or you can find some more information about her work on skepticsbook.com. And until next time, this has been Dr. Reggie Reports. Hello, I'm Tony Pittman, the presenter of the weekly radio show and podcast, Reality Check, broadcast from here in Melbourne, Australia. And if you like listening to The Skeptic Zone, maybe you'd like to check out Reality Check. Each week, we bring you a roundup of LGBT news, that's news related to lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender issues, plus a movie review, plus a serious sceptical analysis of a topic related to pseudoscience or the paranormal. So if that sounds like it could be right up your alley, visit our website at realitycheckonline.net. There you can listen online, download episodes, or subscribe. That's realitycheckonline.net. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Skeptic Zone. Well, we've got another year ahead of us, and uh, that's going to be leading up to TAM Australia, of course, in November, November the 26th to the 28th this year. Lots of details about that uh, in the next couple of months, I think, at the Australian Skeptics website at www.skeptics.com.au and, of course, the James Randi Educational Foundation's website at www.randi.org. 
So, until next week, and I think we'll have a think tank next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. Thank you.